So Malling 9 used to uh, be the province crab of France. Okay. Probably used as early as the 12th century. Uh, but, and then they brought them back, to, uh, kind of make sure they had something that was genetically uniform, started propagating it. So the, the original group were just finds from around Europe. Then M26 is kind of like the first of the crosses they made. I think it's been around since about hey, maybe 1899 or 1900s. Like Molly 26? Malling. Malling? Named after the East Malling Research Station along Ashton, England. Okay. Okay, so this is my rootstock, Malling 26. I've made a uh, not too fabulous cut. Uh, first a long sloping cut. Generally three quarters of an inch to an inch long is what we like. Yeah. Then I've made the tongue cut, which is always above the pith, towards the point. Now I'm going to match it to a piece of cyan wood, and that's about right. S-C-I-O-N. And if you read some of the old genealogy things, you'll see things like C-I-O-N some, sometimes, you know, might say. Uh, so it's, and then I'm going to make the same cuts on the bottom of the cyan. I hope, yeah. Same deal. Again, above the pith, towards the point. I work it in slowly because wood tends to split, you know, once it gets going, the knife really travels. Notice how I hold it, I put my thumb on the side, so if it does hit, the blade hits the end of my thumb, and then the thumbnail stops it, so they don't, because oh. it's not a moving part, so it heals quickly. You're a brave man. Then I simply cut this off so it's a couple buds long. One, two. They go together like a jigsaw puzzle. Put them together with some force. We want good contact. The key is cambial contact. So the, the reproductive layer but that separates the bark or the phloem from the hardwood underneath, the xylem, the, the cambial layer or zone of each has to touch. That reproductive zone has to touch. It'll take, you know, 11, 11 to 20 days, depending on temperature and whatever, for that to heal. The cyanwood wood was collected back in March. It's been in cold storage in the refrigerator. Uh, it's been in a poly bag with a little bit of moist paper towel so it wouldn't dry out. These are just suckers that were growing up in the tree, 100% vegetative wood. We've collected this, brought it out. Now, before this, these buds can break, they've got to go through a heat treatment. So they've got to accumulate so many hours of heat before they can start to grow. During that period of time, the graft union will heal. And I think that's an important point. This is dormant not dead. So some living things are happening, so the healing process will indeed occur. I just gotta get rid of that little ugly tab. And the rootstock is dormant as well? The rootstock is, yeah, semi-dormant. It's gonna grow pretty quickly. It'll grow, it'll respond more quickly than the, uh, the cyan. So the use of dwarf rootstocks is really the key. And it's really interesting, last year we had a very unusual uh, warming event in March. We had eight days, an eight-day period, during which seven days popped 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And it was almost, it was a mirror to within two tenths of a degree Fahrenheit of what happened in the mid-1940s. The difference is in the mid-1940s we had no apples at all. This Last year we still had a pretty decent crop. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons we had a pretty decent crop is because we used a lot of dwarfing rootstocks. <laughs> And the, the apples grafted on dwarfing rootstocks had almost full crops. The ones on standard rootstocks had a dramatically reduced crop. Okay, it's so just the, the nature of a dwarf rootstock? Well, part of it is, is the fact that you, there, the, you tend to plant the trees closed and you create almost a tent-like environment, which helps mm -hmm. to you know, protect it uh, temperature-wise. The other issue, though, is that dwarfing rootstocks tend to, tend to stimulate flower production on one-year-old wood. And the flower buds that form on your old wood are three to five days uh, later in development than the flower buds that develop on spurs. So as a result, you end up with a tree that's better able to handle late frost. And what did you wrap that with? Oh, that that's, plastic? That's just a, a, a plastic bread bag. This came off, uh, let me see, <laughs> this came off high crown white bread. And why do you use a bread bag? Well, it's, it's A, it's food grade polyethylene, and B, it does not have any uh, UV stabilizers in it, so it's going to break down rather quickly out in the environment under sunlight, which I want. To, because it's food grade, it doesn't have any chemicals that can damage my living tissue, which is very important. Okay. And because it's cheap. 
So it works very well. It's free with a loaf of bread? Correct. Yeah, <laughs> like and it works like very, it. very well. And I am, after all, cheap. So that was a Macintosh. This is your uh, old-fashioned old 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 Mac, old Striper Mac, which uh, some would contend has better flavor than some of the newer Macs that are on my, the market. My customers say so, which is why I'm wanting some. Okay. But I want them on a dwarf rootstock. I don't blame you, because you want to live to get the fruit. And, you know, if I was planting apple trees for wildlife out in the woods, particularly if I'm trying to draw deer in, which seems to be a very popular uh, deal right now, yeah. then I would, I would want to have well, probably a, a standard size rootstock uh, as my deal. I would put a, some sort of a wire cage around the tree until it was five or six years old, and then the tree should be up above the browse under the deer, and the tree will survive long term. Unfortunately, on standard rootstock, we're talking seven, eight, nine, ten, some of these longer years before they come into production. From my perspective, as a person who wants to eat apples, I want them into production quickly. And with dwarfing rootstocks, we know we can have fruit as early as two years after planting, but typically within three years we will. Oh, I didn't realize it was that quick. Now these won't be quite that quick because we, we have, in a sense, we have to take a year. We have to grow next year what you would normally buy from the nursery. Right. But certainly within four years I'd anticipate some fruit. Oh, that's so I cut my bread bag into strips that are roughly an inch wide, if I can find one in here. I know there's one here. And yeah, where did they go? There's one. But they're very well grabbing these. I simply start below the graft union. I hold it with my finger and, and notice I stretch it lightly with my thumb as I go. So it's making a nice tight seal that will prevent that, that cambial zone from drying out. Very, very important that cambial zone not dry out. If it dries out, the graft union will fail because the healing that has to occur has to come from that reproductive layer of tissue called the cambium. I just do a simple half hitch die it off. So if it dies, yep. we'll still have a rootstock. Correct. Even if it and dies, we can start over. We can graft it again next year if it dies. Correct. But I would normally expect, you know, the success rate with this type of grafting to be pretty close to 100 percent. It's pretty close to perfect. <laughs> You want to try to make that that uh, that's first cut. You really want it to be flat. So when you hold the knife laid up against it, there are any gaps. Let me get that in the. Well, obviously, where you, am I? Right there. If you have any gaps, obviously that's air spaces where you're not having cambial contacts. You want a single smooth cut. Okay. So what I've always done for years is I've held the knife very securely in my hand, and I use my thumb like an idler arm. Yep. And as I pull the wood through, I put pressure on. Otherwise, the wood will yield under the pressure of the knife, and you'll end up with a scalloped yep. slope. So now we're going to G30 for these. So when you make your little tag, you want to put Mac G30. Got it? Mm-hmm. I think it said G30. Okay, what's, what's uh, G30 stand for? G30 stands for Geneva 30. So that was a breeding program developed at, uh, for root socks developed by... A guy named Jim Cummins, the father of the guy out at Cummins Nursery. Yes. And he developed a series of root socks called the Cornell Geneva series. Initially yeah. they were called CG, but now they just call them G for Geneva. The yeah. Cornell Geneva series includes quite a few root socks, including this one, G30. G30 is a tree that's probably just a, just a, maybe a tad bigger than that M26, maybe. Which means it's going to be how big? Maybe a 10 to 11 feet max. So again, I'll start with my cuts. First, my long sloping cut. Oh, not very long. Yeah. Get the camera on, so I'm whittling. <laughs> Again, I make my tongue cut. Notice my thumb on the side, so if the blade runs, it hits the end of my thumb, not my, uh, not my knuckle. I've done that once in my life, that's enough. This, I don't really have anything quite big enough, so I'll just line it up on one side. No big deal. My long sloping cut, make my tongue cut. Come off the two buds. Well, actually, just one. That's all right. Doesn't matter. One's all it takes. Put them together, make sure they line up on one side because the cyan is slightly 
smaller than the rootstock, so we'll at least make sure they're lined up on one side so you get tremendous contact yeah. all along that that uh, whip and tongue that I've made. Yeah. I often call it a whip graft because you know you might have used these as a whip for driving oxen. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And of course the whip and tongue because you make a tongue cut. They would make a great whip. The other thing oh, that's yes. kind of interesting is that they, they are often it's often called bench grafting because it's normally done inside on a bench. Right? That simple. Yeah, we keep things well, very we don't, simple. We don't do bench grafting here. We're doing tailgate grafting. <laughs> yes. So right. this is a tailgate graft. So I'm just going to wrap this nicely so it's nice and uh, protected. I don't want that cambial tissue to dry out. We need that reproductive tissue alive and well. And now I just do my half hitch. And we have cloned. Yeah, I don't... Mad cloners. Okay. <laughs> so, oh, wait, this is show me, uh, explain to me where, where you're cutting the rootstock now and why. Well, I'm normally trying to cut four or five inches above the root, above, above the top root. Yeah. Eventually, as I plant these trees out, I'm going to want this graft union to be about two inches above ground. Yeah. So, I'll plant it to here in my garden this year. This will root up in here. When yeah. I move it out into the final spot, I'll probably move that soil line up to there. The entire shank will be rooted. My graft union will be above ground. Okay. Macintosh was originally an apple seedling. Yeah. And if it is allowed to root, which it would do attached to a to a rootstock, you'd end up with a full size tree. So we have to make sure we keep the graft union above ground so that the tree remains dwarf. Okay. I'm just gonna sharpen. So it. you're not Really counting the number of buds. Nah, I don't pay any attention to it. Some people do. I, I can't be bothered. So, I'm going to plant these in the, in veg, the, in the vegetable garden. Correct. In the veggie garden this year. Correct. All right. And uh, and they're going to grow hopefully reasonably well. Normally, I'd suggest you you know maybe plant them about a foot apart. Leave them in the vegetable garden all next summer if you can bring yourself to do that. And then either dig them in October of 2014 and move them down or move them or dig them very early in the in the spring of 2015 and move them then. In the ideal world two full summers in the vegetable garden. Now if some of these trees grow really well this year dig those out and move them next spring into your final resting spot. And what do I mean by really well? You know at least 35, 36 inches of growth. So if they pop right oh, up wow. pretty well, great. If not Leave them in the vegetable garden for two years before you move them. Do I fertilize them or anything? Yeah, you can start fertilizing them, uh, but but wait till they grow a bit. Yeah. yeah. Let them get started. Yeah. Maybe maybe just get something like some uh, Miracle Grow and give them a weekly shot of that from about uh, oh, I'll say June one through about the tenth uh, of July and then call it quits. Okay. The next year, we can challenge them a little more. So, in a sense, what you're doing, I mean, in, the commer in a commercial nursery, these would be grafted now, and they would do exactly what I've suggested. They would they would sort them in the spring. The ones that had really grown well, they would dig out and sell as what they call half grafts. They, but most of them would be in the nursery for two summers, so they have branches, and then be sold as uh, quote unquote feathered trees. So the branches are often called feathers uh -huh. in the nursery trade. They're not technically feathers, and I'll explain that difference in a sec. But let me see. Pull this down. So what's going to happen, obviously, is these buds are going to start to grow. In the ideal world, if they're both growing well, I'd thin them down to a single bud, a single shoot, and get rid of all the shoots down here eventually. Like the middle of the summer? Yeah, maybe by middle of June, they're growing well, pick just the best one. I like to put a road grade stake or something near it and tie it loosely to it so it doesn't get broken off. Birds will sometimes land on them or break them off, which is a pain in the neck. And it'll grow uh, pretty vigorously, hopefully, in, in a nice upright fashion. Uh, stake it. Stake it. Let it rip. Keep them watered. And uh, fertilize them lightly with something like Miracle Grow, and you'll end up with a pretty nice tree.
called a rooted layer or a rootstock and you'll notice that it was excised or cut off of something last year. Well how is this grown? Because rootstocks like varieties don't come true to seed. So we have to propagate them in a non-sexual or asexual manner. So in this particular case, if I was going to try to propagate this at home, I would simply plant it in my garden about here, and then I would cut it off two or three inches above ground level. In response to that pruning, buds would break and form vigorous upright shoots. Above ground? Above ground. And below ground, doesn't really matter, but several shoots would shoot up in response to that hard pruning. Okay. During the course of the summer, I would gradually cover the bottom third of those with moist sawdust. While they're still attached to this root system, yeah. and yet mounted in moist sawdust, they will root. Come spring, very early spring, I pull the sawdust away, I cut them off, they'll have roots, and I have this, a rooted layer. And the parent plant will do it again, and again, and again forever. This process is called stooling, S-T-O-O-L-I-N-G, so it's a stool bed, it's called. It's just a form of layering, and it works.